evening, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah. Barely. A little afternoon. bit of a switch up from usual. I'm going to lead us off with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this amazing opportunity to come together and worship before you, God. Let our prayers resonate in the cauldrons of heaven. Let the firmament be astounded by our reverence for you. May we be vessels of your spirit to take those in. God, I thank you for how you love us, and I pray that we can be receptive of your word today and always. Thank you for free you. Christ, I pray. Um, this is a unique opportunity to be out here enjoying the sun shining upon our skin, the wind blowing in our hair. One of the early church fathers, Origen of Alexandria, said that if you believe that the God of nature is the God of scripture, then why do you not expect the same difficulties that we see in nature in scripture as well? Now, this is a controlled environment for the most part. It's, I mean, Jesse and Lynn and those who worship would argue it's not <laughs> because there's way more going on out here than there is when we're at Bridgewater. But, I mean, the grass is manicured. The trees are pruned. When you really step out into nature, it can get pretty violent. It's beautiful, but at the same time, it can get pretty violent. And in the scriptures, we encounter these same sorts of beauty and violence right next to each other. Now, being this is the campus service, some of you guys might be asking, why is Ty wearing a red shirt? <laughs> where, where is his, his UT orange? Yeah. <laughs> fear not, fear not. I want you guys to remember this shirt throughout this sermon. This is a Switzerland soccer kit. And I'm going to start off with a story about the Swiss watch crisis, otherwise known as the quartz crisis. And how we can take these moments in history and use them as a vehicle to not repeat the same mistakes today. So I got into watches about five years ago. My granddad was someone who I was really close with. And when he passed away, he didn't leave me much, but he left me with this incredible watch in the 1950s that I always wear. And it is a mechanical watch. Those of you guys who know anything about watches, that means it doesn't keep time very well. <laughs> So that explains me being late to everything for all of you guys who have caused the struggle with my tardiness. But at the same time, right, I bring it back to Switzerland. Switzerland is known for their watches. You might think, when I mention Switzerland, you might think banks, watches, chocolate, right? Those are probably the, the main, the big things. And they've been good at watches for over probably about 100 years at the point of 1960. And in the 1960s, what ended up happening is the Japanese found an a technological improvement in the watchmaking industry. And what they found is that you could take the mineral, the crystal mineral quartz, and you could place it in the watches with a battery, and it would keep time much more accurately. And you know what the Swiss said? We don't need that. <laughs> We're the best. We got watches down. And the Japanese said, fine. We'll make our own watches. And the Swiss watch industry tanked in the, six, in the end of the 60s for all of the 70s and the majority of the 80s. In the very late 80s, 
Many Swiss watch companies had went out of business. Even though these companies were publicly trading, they were so prideful that they had decided to just double down on making like even fancier mechanical watches. We'll use more precious metals. We'll just do what we do better. But in reality, this crisis, as it's known in history, is an opportunity for transformation and change. And we can learn from the mistake of these Swiss watch companies here in the church. I bring this up for our campus kickoff because for those of you guys who are in campus and for those of you teens, this church is going to be yours one day. You will inherit this church. Everyone who was born will die. And as we progress on in our years we have to trust that change will happen it's inevitable and those who are in the campus ministry are those who are raising up as leaders those who are in the team ministry are those who are raising up as leaders and we need to be cautious to have them feel heard and listened to we need to pour into them so that we don't end up like the swiss watch companies that spent way too many years missing out on a great opportunity of economic prosperity. They had lost billions of dollars. But at the same time, this is an even more urgent situation for our fellowship because instead of losing out on money, we could lose out on souls. Let's turn to the scriptures. Philippians chapter four. Start off with verse one. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, let me pause. Either last week or a few weeks ago, Bill Graham delivered communion. And he said, anytime there's a therefore in the scriptures, you need to turn back and read what was happening earlier. So please read through Philippians later today, throughout the week, before service on Sunday next week. Go back and check out the rest of the story. I continue, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Theodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. So this is a church in Philippi. I pronounced that right, right, Jesse? This is a church in Philippi where the Apostle Paul is writing to them in high regard, a good church. He says, I love and long for my joy and crown, right? However, we see division amongst the disciples, division amongst the followers of Jesus. How, how is that possible? If everyone loves God, how can there be division? Simply impossible, eh? But look at this. Paul says that he pleads for these two sisters not to uh, that one is right and the other is wrong. Not that one is in sin and the other is not in sin. He pleads that they be in the same mind in the Lord. I think that a lot of our issues can be resolved as long as we're in the same mind as the Lord among the fellow. I think a lot of issues with those who are not yet followers of Christ can be resolved as long as we approach them in the same mind, the Lord. Verse 3 says, Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, who na whose names are written in the book of life. Now, it would be low-hanging for, for me to say, ah, you know, women are going to quarrel. They're going to fight. They're going to have arguments. 
I know, right? Too late. <laughs> But look at how look at how look at how Paul addresses them. He says basically that they are heroes of the faith. How can heroes of the faith who are contending to share and spread the gospel not get along? Well, it's here in the scriptures. All right? And what is the remedy? Paul didn't say, Clement, go tell Eodia that, you know, she needs to think more like Syntyche. He says, make sure they're of the same mind as Christ. Make sure they're in the same mind as the Lord. What stands even further to amaze me is that their names are written in the book of life. Sometimes when we don't agree, when we don't get along, when we have division amongst us, we we get angry. We we sin as a result. But if we stay in the same mind of the Lord with our brother and sister, even if it doesn't resolve our political difference, our disagreement in the fellowship. Whatever it may be, God is glorified through that. Proverbs 17, verse 9 says, Whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. That very same chapter of, of the book of Proverbs in verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother born, born for a time of adversity. Let's think back to the Swiss, Swiss watch crisis for a minute, the fourth crisis. A time of adversity can make us or break us. A time of adversity could cause our church to crumble and cease to exist, or it can be a catalyst for change. It can be a catalyst for prosperity. It can be a catalyst for growth. It's all about the perception and the way in which we set our minds, and who, rather, we set our minds upon. Let's go to Philippians Chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice! He yells it. There's an exclamation point there. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer, and petition with thanksgiving. Present your, uh, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Rejoice. Some of you guys are intimately aware with where Paul was when he wrote this letter to this church. He was in prison. And yet, he yells to rejoice. And the mechanism by which he's able to rejoice is by prayer, is by focusing on Christ not by focusing on his earthly present circumstances. And he says that the peace of God, which is basically greater than we can understand or comprehend, will lend you a hand. He goes on in verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. We have access to commune with the God of peace at any moment, at any day, through any circumstance or any season, whether it be a crisis or a time of feasting like we're about to have here soon, we have access to the creator and to the one who can give us rest. Amen. Eternal rest, not just a good night's sleep, not just eight hours on a nice soft bed, but rest that transcends what your mind can even comprehend. Peace that transcends what your mind can comprehend. Peace that guards your mind. Peace that is a safeguard. In fact, let's let's look at that. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Furthermore, all right, good thing Bill talked about this last week or two weeks ago. Again, if there's therefore or furthermore, you got to go back and read what happened. And then if I go back, it says therefore again in chapter 2, verse 1. So just read the whole thing of Philippians, I'm telling you. But again, I go back to chapter 3, verse 1. Furthermore, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. He yells it, Paul does. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Rejoicing in the Lord is a safeguard for you, 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 every one of you, and me. A safeguard against what exactly? Well, I think that it's a safeguard against falling in to the traps of the world. I think it's a safeguard against Paul being bummed out in prison. I think it's a safeguard against whatever it was that Eodia and Synthike were fighting about, disputing about, not in the same mind of Christ about. I think it's a safeguard against the attacks of those who were persecuting Jesus' followers in Philippi. Rejoicing is a safeguard against the things that are not of God. Rejoicing is a safeguard Rejoicing in the Lord is a safeguard against allowing our old way of living for those of us who are baptized into Christ from coming back into our lives. Let's look at what Paul says about moving on from things of the past and making every effort towards the things that are of Christ, the things that are eternal, the things that are truly important. In Philippians 3, chapter 7, we see Paul writes, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, garbage, that I may gain Christ. Do we consider our 401ks garbage? <laughs> Do we consider our house renovations garbage? Do we consider our new kitchen countertops garbage? Do we consider that new fly outfit that I got for the first week of campus garbage? Be honest with ourselves. Paul goes on in verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss. Sorry, uh, verse uh, 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, 
He has to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his, in his death. Do you seek to be more like Christ crucified? Do you seek to be cruciformed to, for your life to be a physical representation of Jesus on the cross? Do you seek to be with him in his suffering? And yet still rejoicing? <laughs> on the college campus, we have to die to ourselves of a lot of things. College is a difficult time to navigate life. And there's a lot of things that would bring glory to our flesh that does not bring glory to God. And even though we're talking about campus, this does not necessarily go away. For those of you guys who have gone out of that phase of campus life into whatever phase you're in now. Whether you're married or single, there are still things that will give you strife as you progress on. And that you have to put to death and be cruciform in the shape of Christ for. I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what those things are for you. But let the scripture challenge you. Go back and read this on your own time in quiet contemplation and meditation. And ask, what area of my life am I holding on to that Christ already saved me from? In verse 11, he says, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. I go on to verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. With the Olympics, there was a lot of, it, it's very innocent fun to watch the Olympics, but, but there's a lot of devoting one's life to a piece of metal. There's a lot of straining for things that are only important for however long you're blessed to be on this earth. What Paul is writing about is to strain towards what is eternally important. And I I encourage you, we, we hear, if you're visiting here at the Knoxville Church, we don't do altar calls, but rather we invite each and every one of us whether we have been going to church for two weeks or for 45 years, to continue an honest seeking, honest seeking of God, and to read the scriptures and to pray every day and to meditate on what it says. And let the scripture be the measuring stick. Let Jesus' life be the measuring stick for your life. I encourage you, if you're visiting here today, to engage in that type of a discipline, a spiritual discipline. I encourage you here visiting today to study the Bible. Studying the Bible, if you're new to it, can be daunting, can be extremely challenging. But I akin it to being out of shape and getting a gym membership. Right? When you have someone to help you in the gym when you're out of shape you get a personal trainer that hour that you spent by yourself lollygagging trying to figure out what's up and what's down with the weights that personal trainer can take you leaps and bounds in that same amount of time so please if, if this seems like a daunting challenge to navigate through this text and try and figure out what's up and what's down 
be humble like Paul is being when he's writing to the church of Philippi and say, hey, can you help me with this? Would, would you mind helping to walk me through what this says? I leave you with Paul's closing sentence in his letter to the church of Philippi, to the Philippians. An apostolic prayer of sorts. In verse 23, he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.